So I'm going to talk about bounds for the least solutions of homogeneous quadratic Fantan inequalities. So this is based on joint work with Gutierrez, Goetze, and Margulis. All right, so the setting is going to be the following. I'm going to take Q to be a non-degenerate. Degenerate. Indefinite. Quadratic form. In d greater than 5 equal 5 variables. Just for later use in notation, I will write q square root x uh, with square brackets x when I think of q as a quadratic form, but I'm also going to think q of q as a symmetric matrix. And this is defined like this with the normal inner product on r to the d. Okay. Also, I will denote by the absolute value of Q, the determinant of Q in absolute value. Another piece of notation that I'm going to use is I'm going to denote with Q plus as a matrix the square root of Q squared. So this is a positive definite absolute value of Q. Uh, and for this Q plus, I'm going to assume that the eigenvalues of Q are positive. And denoted by lambda 1 to lambda t, and I'm going to assume that they're greater equal than 1. Um, so the problem that I'm interested in is founding, finding bounds, non-trivial bounds for the solution of the inequality Q of x is less or equal or strictly less than epsilon, with x an integer vector. All right, so the reason this question makes sense is in the integral case, we have Maya's theorem. So the reason this makes sense is in the integral case, we have Maya's theorem, which tells us that any indefinite integral quadratic form in d greater than 5 variables um, represents 0 non-trivially. And we also have the Oppenheim conjecture, which states that if q is an, is an irrational form in d greater equal than 3 variables, then this admits a solution. So it makes sense to ask for the size of the least integral solution to such an equation. So let me tell you just a little bit what results in this area. So one of the first results in this area was a theorem due to castles around the mid-50s, which states, and let me just formulate it a little bit differently. So let B be a quadratic form and take lambda to be a, a lattice of rank M greater or equal than 3. Now, if on this lattice lambda, the, the, integral, the quadratic form takes integral values, and the solution or the equation PV equals to zero is solvable on the lattice. <laughs> then there exists a solution to the equation PV equals to zero with a bound on V. So there exists a a lattice point B in lambda such that B of V is equal to 0. And the size of V is bounded by the following expression. So a constant depending only on D times the trace of B squared to the D minus 1 halves times the determinant of lambda squared. 
So in particular, this gives me a, a bound for the least solution of when it comes to integral forms. So if q hap or say if p is equal to q is integral, and we take the lattice zd, then by Maya's theorem, since we have d greater equal than five variables, there exists a, an integer x in z to the d, such that qx is 0, and the size of x is bounded by essentially the largest eigenvalue of q to the power t minus 1. OK. So in a, an example of Knesa shows that for signature t minus 1, 1, this is the best solution. And Schlickevi then gave an extension of this theorem taking into account the signature. All right. So the next result in this direction was Birch Davenport. And their setting was, suppose that Q is diagonal. And then they show that for any delta greater than 0, the equation or the inequality qx is less than 1, is solvable with an integral vector x, with x satisfying this bound. So q plus of x, which is just the square root of q plus to the 1 half x squared. This is less than c delta, the determinant of q to the power 1 plus delta. D greater than 5. Yeah. OK. So a main ingredient of their proof was to use this version of Castle's theorem. Um, also, another thing is that this is really, this result is essentially optimal given this bound. All right. So the theorem that we prove. Well, I mean, in this setting, it's going to be mainly irrational because okay, the integral case is already covered by. Go down to three oh, yeah. Without, uh, yeah. But, um, if you are integral mm -hmm. and three variables and you want the shortest vector, then it's a, uh, basically integral forms, indefinite integral mm -hmm. forms in three variables, yeah. especially if you go to the spin double cover, a class number one. Because they have class number one, you have a purely local to global principle. So it's just a question of what's the smallest local obstruction. Okay. And that becomes a much easier problem. I, I mean, I discussed this with Mark Lewis many times. I think he wrote a paper with one of his students, and then Zhang wrote a paper with him. You know this? I don't know about it. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, if you talk about mm -hmm. an integral case, an mm -hmm. irrational case, this uh, does boil down to. And in three variables, there's modular form methods that are much more powerful. Uh, oh. But as long as you talk irrational three variables, then you don't Well, greater than five. Of this little obstruction that d halves minus 2 but needs to be greater than zero. Yes, this is rational. Yeah, okay. This is so the rational case. Yes. Theorem, and that theorem is about mm -hmm. local to global principles for, mm -hmm. uh, for integral quadratic forms. And uh, mm -hmm. we understand this. Yes, yeah. Beyond mm -hmm. long, uh, Castles mm -hmm. does not understand, no, the local to global principle was mm -hmm. not understood. Uh -huh. Make that clear. Uh, yes. Uh, in okay. the definite case, mm -hmm. or in certain, if you're indefinite, I'm just explaining to why mm -hmm. the 
probably solved already but a long time ago, which is called the Bosch laser. Yes. So the right. number is one. Okay. So it's a purely local question. Yeah, no, in this case, so I'm mainly interested in the irrational case. Okay. In the irrational case. Yeah, the rational is already covered by this one in at least the bounds of the least solution. So I'm looking at the bounds of the least solution of inequalities like that. I want to get a bound for the size of x. Right, in the irrational case. Yes, in the rational case. Yeah. And just because my brother spent a lot of time mm -hmm. about five years ago worrying about this least solution in the rational case, and I think he did write, I think yeah, he wrote a paper, right? With Peter Peter Zhang. Peter Zhang. With his student, and also I think Zhang then eventually got involved in that. So, oh. and that's a local question, sort of. All right, so the result that we show here is that if Q is not necessarily um, diagonal, then for any delta greater than zero, the inequality Qx is less than one is solvable with a vector x of size bounded by the following expression, with a constant depending only on delta and the dimension d. And here the determinant of q to the 1 times the largest eigenvalue of q in absolute value to the power 4d over d minus 4 plus delta. So in particular, just by rescaling this, we see that for any epsilon greater than 0, the inequality qx is less than epsilon, is solvable in non-trivial integral vectors with this. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a major issue there. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a little problem there that happens. With x squared. Hmm? So I'm not going to use SOQ, so which was probably. Yes. So with the size of x bounded by epsilon to the minus d minus 1 minus 4d to the d minus 4 plus delta for any, say, delta. And this also depends now on q. So in the case d equals to 5, we get a solution of size epsilon to the minus 12. It's not optimal. The optimal solutions should be epsilon to the minus 2. Um, but yeah, at least we have something that is polynomial in epsilon inverse. All right, so. Let me now go to the meat of this thing. So for p, say, greater than some constant lambda t to the 1 half, I'm going to consider this set EP, basically the set of integral vectors where qx is supposed to be less than 1 and q plus of x it's less than 5p squared, say. OK. Now let me start studying this equation by int or this set by introducing a lattice. So for t in r, define the following lattice. p q plus minus 1 half p inverse q plus to the 1 half, 1 for t q, 1, and here z to the 2t. And let me just call this gt. All right, so let me start talking about this lattice a little bit. So 
So we're going to study this lattice. So this lattice is going to give us information about small solutions in a certain way, in a certain sense. Uh, so the way we're going to study this lattice is by means of the geometry of numbers. So the normal case is you take your lattice, which say in the case t equals 1 is a point on the upper half space. Then we put it back in the fundamental domain. So you have a lattice point. We put it here. And then the height is essentially 1 over the shortest vector. Uh, so for general lattices, we cannot understand the behavior of the lattice just on the shortest vector. But we need to consider sublattices. So for a lattice, just let me introduce a little bit of notation. So for a lattice, lambda in r to the 2d define alpha i of lambda to be basically the sh one of the shortest i-dimensional sublattice in this sense, d lambda l where L is an i-dimensional subspace. Um, L intersected lambda is a lattice in L. And the symbol D lambda L is just a volume of L mod L intersected gamma lambda. So it's essentially, just take a basis of the, this lattice in L, wedge it. Take the norm, and that's d lambda l. So it's the shortest i-dimensional sublattice. Yes, a supremum. A sup. Uh, and then the, the one that is going to substitute the shortest vector for general lattices is just the maximum over all of these things. Uh, now, alpha lambda is kind of hard to understand because you need to consider many sublattices. But so it happens to be that this lattice is symplectic, and it behaves essentially the same way as two-dimensional unimodular lattices. So we have this little lemma. We have a nice seal set, sp2dr is equal to s times sp2dz, where this s is a standard Siegel set on the symplectic group. So the maximal compact group, ud, I'm going to use k later, so ju I'm just writing ud, times a, 2 over square root 3, and 1 half. Now let me just write what all of these things are. So ud is just a maximal compact subgroup, just the orthogonal symplectic matrices. Um, n, one half is just basically the unipotence, um, where u just upper triangular, uij, uij less or equal than one half, and b is symmetric, and the edges of b are bounded by one half. All right, but the more important part is this diagonal part. A of 2 over square root 3. This is essentially the one that controls all the successive minima and hence all these alpha i functions. So alpha 1 to alpha d, alpha 1 inverse to alpha d inverse. Where now alpha i divided by alpha i plus 1 does not increase too much. So in a sense, it's almost decreasing. Um, 2 over square root of 3 for every i less than d minus 1. So these first ones are going to be the shortest vectors. And ad squared is bounded by 2 over square root of 3. All right. So a1 is essentially the shortest vector. a2 is the second shortest vector. a3 is the third successive minima. And so yeah, I think I can still put it in here. And so we see that alpha i, so if you have a lattice which is already reduced in S, 
say the diagonal port is A, then alpha i of my lattice lambda is just A1 to AI inverse. Just by the nature of this and this, we see that the one that dominates all the alpha functions is the alpha d1. All right, so in other words, alpha d can be, is the one that replaces the alpha function. So instead of looking at all subdimensional la uh, of, uh, at all lattices of all dimensions, we just need to look at d-dimensional sublattices of lambda. So the other one is obviously that one is always greater than alpha d of lambda. So this is really just the proof is by induction. If you knew that sp2dr mod sp2dz had one cusp, then that would be a one-liner. Um, but we did it by hand. So that's all right. So now we have one lattice that dominates everyone. So in a way, I can start understanding this lattice a little bit better. Uh, so let me start with a small lemma here to give you a just a feeling of why this is helpful or why we're looking at this. So if I take my lattice lambda t, and if I look at the alpha t function at time lambda t, then this is going to be bounded for all t by p to the t divided by the determinant of q to the 1 half. All right, so let me just give you a quick fake proof of this. So the way to compute, so 1 is greater than alpha t lambda t inverse. Essentially, this is a product of the first t successive minima. Uh, the way to compute this by this reduction theory is to find a symplectic matrix, integral matrix. Just wedge it here. Take the wedge product of the first d columns. Take the product. Oh, so let me, again, now multiply things so that you can see what I am doing here. So I have here pq plus minus 1 half x plus 4tqy. And here I have p inverse q plus to the 1 half y. I have something here. And I'm taking E1 to the ED. All right, now to the fake part of the proof. Suppose that D is 1. Then x and y are just numbers. And what I'm doing here is I'm finding a Diophantine approximation to 4TQ. So essentially, this is going to be small. Now, by the choice of P, I chose P to be greater than some constant times lambda, the, shortest, the largest eigenvalue of Q to the 1 half we see that y cannot be 0. So since y cannot be 0, we see that this whole determinant here is basically dominated by this factor. So if you then do the math here, it happens that this is just greater than q to the 1 half divided by p to the d times the determinant of y. So it happens to be that we can show that when y is invertible, that is the worst case. So we have this upper bound. So I hope you can start seeing what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to find Diophantine approximations of q via co-prime symmetric matrices. OK. OK, now I can delete this. OK, so here comes the observation. So this is my fundamental domain. I know that my, my lattice is lambda t can never pass above this part. So they're never in the cusp. But now what I'm actually going to look at is that if I pass a certain threshold, to the 1 half. If I pass a certain threshold, say h is greater than 1, but not too large, and you're going to see how large it shouldn't be, then I'm claiming that if I have here my 
basically the path of lattices. If I have a lattice that is above that threshold, that gives me a solution in my set EP. So that's the main idea. All right, so, so assume this set. So just for technical reasons, I need to take an interval lambda 1 over p to the lambda 1 1 half, p delta. Delta is the one, this delta that we're choosing arbitrarily small. So I'm assuming that this set jh, the set of times in this interval i, where alpha d is above the threshold, say pd over the determinant of q to the 1 half, 1 over h. Assume that this is non-empty. So if it's non-empty, so if it's non-empty, take a time t in this jh, and take this lattice alpha t. Then reduce this lattice to write it as okay, inverse as gt x y and here e1 to ed. Um, yeah, let me call this gamma. So this is integral sim symplectic. All right, so I have this thing. Now I'm claiming that if this is small enough, which means that alpha t is large enough, I get a solution in EP. All right, so what I do is basically I use this form of the theorem of castles. So I take my lattice delta t, generated by the first d coordinate, uh, the first d columns of this matrix. So gt, gamma, e1, gt, gamma, ed. Now the determinant of this lattice is essentially alpha t. Uh, no, this is the next point. So take this quadratic form dv defined by a v v, where a is this matrix. 0, 0, 1, minus 4 t p squared q plus inverse q. So something that should be relatively clear is if we have large enough alpha t, I should get solutions to that equation. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking a rational approximation of q. Now, if the rational approximation is good enough, a solution of this rational part being 0 is going to essentially give me a solution to the Diophantine inequality qx is less than 1. So this is just reformulating this whole thing a little bit nicer so that the constants that I get are better to write down. So now I'll take um, v in this lattice, v, write it as v1, v2 of the form gt, gamma, n0 with n an integral vector. Then what you start to see is that if you plug in v into this quadratic form, what you get is, first of all, v1, v2, I mean, uh, I hope you believe me here, minus 4t, q, y, n. But at the same time, if you then expand this, what you see is what, that you get y prime x of n. OK, so it happens to be that because of my choice that I took here, that t is not too small. This is not only, so since, it's a, since x, y is a symplectic matrix, essentially, this is going to be symmetric, integral. And by my choice of t, I can show that this is indefinite. All right. So by Maya's theorem, I can find a solution to the equation y prime x is equal to 0, which gives me a solution of b, v equals to 0 on the lattice delta t. So by the theorem of castles, I can say there exists a v 
in this lattice delta t, solving this equation of size bounded by, by the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of p, which essentially is t p squared times t minus 1 times the determinant of my lattice, which is alpha t lambda t minus 2. So and by uh, how I assumed that jh was not empty, this is just um, t to the d minus 1 times q h squared divided by p squared. Yes? Oh, so gamma is a. Just looking at that part of the LDS procedure. Yes. Yeah. Gamma is Sorry, an integer. Yeah. Just working on that part of the old Yes. Oh, okay. Just That's by. Why you need many yes. Well, I mean, we could also put a Diophantine equation and then a uh, Diophantine condition on Q. What? Excuse me? If you had three variables, yes. irrational. Yeah, but I, I think to get something. Um, I mean, then you wouldn't be able to appeal because. Yes. But you wouldn't have the bottom corner to play again. Am I right? No, I mean, I think this will be in two players. Where did you double the number of variables? What? Where did you double the number of variables? Oh, that. that uh, <laughs> yes. What's the problem? Oh, so first of all, so the problem is really that 4 over 2 minus 2 is not greater than 0. That's essentially the issue. Yeah. So I'm going to come to that issue. So I'm really assuming here that this is not empty. And then what I'm showing is that if h is not too large, then I actually get solutions in this EP. So I, I find, so if, so points lattice of high height basically give me solutions of that Diophantine equation. So that's what I'm trying to say. Now I need to be able to say that under some circumstances I find lattices of high height. So that's where the issue with d half minus 2 actually okay. comes into play. So this is not the problem with, okay. with d greater than 5. Um, okay, so if I have points of high height, I get solutions in EP. OK, now I need to say why or how I come to this conclusion. All right, so this is the main problem. So I have this proposition. So for any delta greater than 0, there is a constant C delta positive such that for any, the property that for any p greater than this constant times say the determinant of q to the 1 half plus delta, if this set EP is empty, then, and here comes the issue, P d half minus 2 over q to the 1 fourth is less or equal or less than this integral over i, where i is my, my interval 1 over p lambda 1 half p delta alpha t to the lambda t to the 1 half dt. So if I have no solutions, I get that thing, which is essentially what Birch and Davenport did, just in, in this language of lattices. And the main. The main problem why we cannot go down to say d equals 4, d equals 3, is that we need this to be growing in, in p, since this is greater than 1. 
Birch and Davenport and Dragonfish, they use the circle thing. They do kind of a version of it, like a weird version. Well, yeah. it's so they assume that they have no solutions in this set, and then they get out. The question is when yeah. they're producing integer solutions, eventually, are they? Yeah, they produce it out of this inequality, essentially. Hear this? Uh, Birch, Davenport. Birch, Davenport. They do it for yeah. anything, but essentially yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, for yeah, irrational. What you do is they, uh, if you have diagonal, mm -hmm. you have one irrational. If it's rational, then that's the circle method that you do this. And if it's irrational, they'll take it from, they'll do this. Uh, uh, you can write, write down the same. Mm -hmm. you can, there's a whole book by Davenport on yes. Byzantine equations and inequalities. You can mm -hmm. write down using Fourier integral. Mm -hmm not equal to zero, but less than, and they usually have the convergence of alpha. They assume one of the, can assume mm -hmm. one of the coordinates of the diagonal form is irrational relative to the other. Yeah, that's what- they run mm -hmm. the circle thing. It's um, just- So that's what Davenport and Heilbronn did. And this is- Birch Davenport did a similar thing, but the starting point was, they assumed that for some p, and then p is, of the form q to the one plus delta, there is no solution. And then out of getting no solution, they, they get that for a middle segment, this integral has to be large. Yeah, I would imagine it's coming from some method which, I mean, what the circle method does is allows you to write down an inequality in mm -hmm. an equation. Yes. Uh, the, uh, as an integral, uh, you can write mm -hmm. the solution as an integral. So you, if you're looking for integer solutions, you write down all integers. Yes, so that's exactly what they do. They take this exponential yeah, sum, right, right. and then they pick out the yeah. non-existent solutions. Okay, just, what? okay, so this is what you get from that analysis. Yes, from the analysis. So basically, I take this exponential sum, or exponential series. I, since, and then I pick out the solutions by a nice enough kernel. But right. essentially, since I have no solutions, I get that my whole integral over the, my exponential sum is zero. Correct. So over a middle segment, it turns out that the other segments are small, mm -hmm. so this has to be large, okay. which is kind of already the absurd thing yeah. because you're but expecting I, this to be large. I guess what I was driving at yeah. is that for them, it's obvious to me why you need five variables. Yes. And why four variables would be already very hard and three would be out of the question. Right? Yes, no, yeah. no, my From starting point. point of view, huh? it's not clear. No, my, so the point of view, we, the way we start is with this exponential series. Oh, you are using that? We are using exponential series, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so we are, so I was trying to not mention that because it takes a while to get to this inequality. Now, I would understand right? where you, no. Now, I was trying. I, I didn't huh? understand where you make an integer. So I. <laughs> where did you find this? Where did you pick it out of your pocket? No, so I was, I was trying to avoid this part because it takes a while to get there. But essentially the starting point. So you are running a circle method. Yes, like, okay, yes, but right. I'm assuming that I have no. Yeah, but I'm assuming that I have no solutions, and then I, if I pick no, them no, out, then. Uh, uh, the point was, uh, you're not mm -hmm. sort of just doing dynamics. Uh, yes. You produce, so this is very important to me. You're producing a solution. I'm producing. You're summing of all the solutions. Okay, you're writing down. Yeah, I'm writing down this <laughs> one. So. That was getting crazy. <laughs> okay. So essentially. Yeah. Yes. So essentially, out of that, I get that if I assume that I have no solutions and I pick out the non-existent solutions, I get that for a middle segment, this exp the integral over this exponential series has to be large. Yeah. But if you are using the circle method, then, mm -hmm. uh, that dies at five anyway, even for integral quadratic forms. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because you can't yeah. break into major and minor arms. Yes, so that's that's in that's exactly what happens here. So we would like this to grow with P and yeah. the problem is that four four over two minus two is zero. So, the, so just to repeat, 
Is hmm? that the reason you stuck at five? Yes. Okay. That's exactly the reason, yeah. Uh, I understand. Because you're using circles. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, and I was hiding this part. Uh, I just didn't want to <laughs> go into this, but. <laughs> okay, so, and now, out of this claim that is already pretty absurd, so I'm basically claiming, so I have no solutions, and then I get this inequality. This already tells me that the expectation of alpha t is already going to be fairly high. Um, and it cannot be too high because high lattices give me solutions. But uh, so that's essentially going to be the idea of this. I'm just catching up with you. Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Huh? Uh, uh, the whole point here is to get rid of the diagonal assumption. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea. So out of this inequality, we want to produce a. Lattice of high height, one quarter. So by taking, say, a beta between 0 and 1 half, I can take the supremum in this interval, this alpha t's, 1 half minus beta. And then I have this integral from over j, over i, of alpha t, lambda t to the beta, dt. So the idea is now basically to say that this integral cannot get too large. So the idea is if we can say that this is bounded by p to the beta d minus 2 over q beta halves times some h to the 1 half minus beta. Yes, now just uh, this is just the idea. So take any beta and then to extract like a largest alpha d, we extract this. And then the idea is to say that this cannot get too large. If we can say that this doesn't get larger than this, then jh is, is going to be non empty. Uh, so then looking at the diagonal case, yeah. Yes, then there's a, a place where alpha d is greater than, say, p to the d, q to the 1 half times 1 over h. Oh, I see. Because you know that the integral is large. Yes. But then once you factor it out, yeah. small, that's what the maximum is. And I wrote it in such a way that if you factor everything and then divide by 1 half minus beta, then this gives exactly that h, jh is non empty. All right, so by looking at the diagonal case, or by studying Birch Davenport really closely, you see that there's kind of a hidden thing here that you need beta d to be strictly greater, or let's say strictly greater than 2. And it happens to be that in our general um, case, we need this assumption beta d to be greater than half, uh, greater than 2. So this is exactly where this 4d over d minus 4 comes from, just by choosing beta to be as small as possible, of the size 2 over d plus some delta. All right. So now I need to tell you how to compute this thing, how to bound this. So and this is the, essentially the averaging, or a version of the averaging result that started with Eski and Margulis and Moses, just in a different setting. OK, so let can you not Yes. The integral is big, and then you want to show it to be big. Yes. I'm showing that magic. Yes. So I'm showing that there's a large alpha d by showing that this is essentially small enough. And the small enough means that this is what we kind of expect for this idea to work. Um, OK, so. Maybe I should. Now I can go into this. 
averaging result. And tell you about the main steps in this averaging. So I should maybe say that in the diagonal case, the averaging is really easy just by decomposing everything into successive minima, since basically lambda t is going to decompose as the sum of um, just two-dimensional sublattices. And we use Hölder and then sum up, so the diagonal case is fairly simple. So for the averaging result, basically consists of three steps. So let me just tell you what I want to do. So yeah, let's start with step one, reduction to SO2. OK, so I'm not going to consider my whole eye, but I'm going to consider smaller segments. And the segments that I'm going to consider are just going to be intervals, say close intervals, T0 to T1 of size less or equal or equal to 1 over the largest eigenvalue of Q in absolute value. So it turns out that that is the right choice. Um, all right, so here we start with I, alpha T, lambda T, T. So just let me tell you here how to reduce this to the case of integrals over SO2. So my lattice lambda t, which I think I erased, yeah. so it's just essentially p q plus minus 1 half, p inverse q plus to the 1 half, 1 for tq. One. Now, by taking a matrix S and OD such that ST Q plus minus 1 QS is 1 PQ, where PQ is the signature of Q, say. So P once and then Q minus once in the diagonal. We can write this as, say, ST. ST, and now let me write here DP. I'm going to say in a second what I mean by this. U4T, and here delta Q, where delta Q is a new lattice. S, Q plus minus 1 half. S, Q plus to the 1 half. Now, this gives me kind of an embedding of SL2R into SP2DR by the following, by sending just AB CD to AB1PQ C1PQ D. And DP or DA, just going to denote the matrix A, A inverse, US. It's going to denote the matrix 1, S, 1. All right, so what I get here, since alpha is left invariant under SO, or orthogonal matrices, this is just alpha T of DP, U of 4T, times delta Q. Now I want to transform this into an integral over SO. So now the, the reason why I'm taking my interval to be bounded comes into play. So I can actually write dp of u for t as, uh, say, by introducing r to be p over lambda 1 to the lambda t to the 1 halves. I can write this as, as dr d lambda d to the 1 halves u of 4 t minus t naught, d over lambda d minus 1 half, 
u of 4 uh, d lambda d to the 1 halves u of 40 naught. OK. Uh, since the diagonal part normalizes u, what we get here is u of 4 t minus t naught divided by lambda d. So changing variables into s equals this part, we see that we're just inter integrating over a fixed interval of length 4. So OK, let me write another line here. So this is the integral if I change. Okay. If I set this to be 4 t minus t naught over lambda t, this is just essentially 1 over lambda t, the integral from 0 to 4, alpha t of dr us, and then here another part, d lambda t to the 1 half u 40 naught and my lattice lambda q. All right, to pass now to the orthogonal part. All right. Just because I think it's interesting to see these computations sometimes. To pass to the orthogonal part, d lambda d to the 1 half u 40 naught delta q. We just multiply this with a good vector here, good matrix. So this matrix, which is orthogonal. So the product of these two things is going to be lower triangular. So it, the usual trick is to conjugate this with the diagonal part, dr. Now call this matrix k theta s transpose. And we need to multiply it here again with k theta s. So this is now a low, like a, this is now something that depends here on s, here on s, and this part decays with r squared. So essentially, this part is bounded in, by the way we constructed the alpha t function. So every time I want here a beta, beta. This is just essentially an integral over the compact group, SO2, k of alpha d, dr, k, and then a fixed lattice lambda, dk. OK, so that's the first step of the, that's probably the, that's the boring part of the reduction, but at least I wanted to show that. Step two is getting a system of integral inequalities. Step two, a system of integral inequalities. Inequalities. And the system of inequalities that we get is the following that, and here comes the main Restriction here. For any beta between 2 over d and 1 half, and any lattice, say symplectic lattice, we get the following system of inequalities that the average over k of this alpha t function of dr k delta to the theta dk is less or equal than a constant c, depending on, on beta, times tau beta d of dr times alpha d at delta to the theta where tau beta dr or tau beta dg, if g is an element in SL2R, it's just an spherical function in SL2R. So it's just it's this thing, dk over g 
k e1 to the theta d, where e1 is just the vector 1, 0. All right, so that's one place where we need beta d to be greater than, than 2, because we need this thing to be greater than 1 when g is not in SO2. So that is one, one point when, where we need beta d to be greater than 2. So this is so the alpha function satisfy this inequality, but also satisfy the other another inequality here. That if you take a say any other SL2R matrix, then this is less or equal than some B times alpha D, say beta here, if Y is less than R. And just for future reference, let me just fix this R naught. R naught. So whenever I fix an R naught, I get this system of inequalities. All right. So your system is the best y inequality. Yes, this is the best inequality that you can get. No, but, but I'm just saying, right? I mean, I think we were making this point before, but I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah. So instead of having, like in the original thing you had, you have, the, you have that system and they're all kind of tied together. Here yes. One There's only one. Yeah, so in uh, your paper, you have the system of inequalities with all alpha i's. And then you need to play around a lot. And also another thing is you not only have this, but you also have another part there. So now this actually simplifies a lot, this type of inequalities. So OK, so we have this system of inequalities. And now let me just say what this system of inequalities actually mean, or in which sense we understand these. Step three is basically reformulating the whole thing, leading into a nicer language. So what we have here is basically an averaging operator. So for f, a continuous function in the upper half space, and say a radius r, let me call this r star, greater than 0. We have an averaging operator on the upper half space. So if we take a point z on the upper half space, we take the line integral around the sphere of radius r star centered at z ds, where this is a line element. So we have, a, we have this mean value operator on the upper half space, which is essentially this thing. Now let me now reformulate the whole thing here. So here comes the theorem. Um, so for any lambda greater than 0, if f is a positive function, Say continuous function on the upper half space, satisfying with the following um, property, su su such that for some radius are not star, the following holds that every mean value around every circle of fixed radius are not is essentially bounded by this. We are not this averaging operator for any circle of radius R naught and R naught is fixed. This is less than tau lambda of d R naught. And I'll just think that R naught without the star is, so R naught with the star is 2 log R naught. Just to make sense of that. Um, times f at z for any z in the upper half space. And not only that, but we have this, this property here, which is a property on balls. That on any ball of radius fixed or not, for any, say, omega in this ball of radius r not star, the value of f at omega is majorized up to a constant by the fixed constant 
by the value of f at the center, then we have the following thing. So okay, maybe let me also write here that R naught star is two log R naught. So then we have the following picture. Here we have the upper half space. We can control the mean value over every sphere of radius R naught star. And the claim is that if we can do that, then we can, then we can control the growth of the, this average among growing circles of radius R in a, a really in a controlled way. So the statement is that then for any R star greater than zero, the average of R star at the origin, these growing averages, is bounded, say, with a constant depending only on lambda, by tau lambda dr and the value of f at the origin. So this is. And now, since lambda is as lambda is greater than two, since lambda is greater than two, this thing grows like r to the lambda minus two, which is exactly the bound that we need. All right. So that basically ends the the last part of this thing. So we have this bound. We can find like a lattice of high height, which gives me a solution. And that is my contradiction to the assumption that I had at the beginning. All right, thank you, thank you.